Sila Tato Katoa, Nao Mai Ki Tine Kori Ro Foka Hira Hira, Ko Grant Smith, Tene Te Koro Matoa O Te Papayoia. Uh, welcome everyone, fantastic to see you here this evening, this afternoon, no, crikey. <laughs> it's getting late in the week and I, I don't, know, don't know if I'm coming or going. It is wonderful to have you here with us and joining us today for um, this Kori Road with Grant Smith about the Chief Post Office and its exciting future. Um, it's something that every time I walk past the old High Flyers building, I sort of scratch my head and think, oh, I wonder what's going to happen to it. Because I, I can remember a few years ago, you know, when it was High Flyers, sort of being in there for the odd thing. And since then, it's kind of got particularly sad. So I'm really excited to be hearing this this, um, this afternoon. So welcome, Grant, and I'm sure you're going to enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jenny. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, welcome, everybody. And look, I'm going to give you a little bit of history as well. So, there is, Jenny, it is about the future, um, but we'll also talk about the history because the building has some magnificent um, bones and, and heritage. Um, and you can see the building there. Um, it, it was quite grand. In fact, it was, uh, it was opened in 1906. It was one of the grandest in the country and, and really defied um, our population at the time. And as men, I have a real connection, um, well, I feel I have a connection to the building and the place. Um, I did my first bank account there, and I know there's probably some people in the crowd that maybe have worked in there. My wife actually worked in there in telephone services. And uh, I just feel that, uh, like you commented before, Jenny, walking past it doesn't do it justice at the moment, and we know all the reasons why. And I'll touch on a few of those. Um, some of you may have been familiar with the Manawatu Standard story that ran last last month where um, property brokers brokered a deal to sell the building um, to new owners, and I have to say fantastic new owners, in the Safari Group. They're a New Zealand family-owned company that specialise in the heritage, and they've done a number of different developments around New Zealand. This will be their first uh, foray into the region of New Zealand and Palmerston North. Uh, and it's, it's quite ins uh, inspiring, the plans, and I'm going to keep them right to the end because I know you all want to see that, but I've got some stuff at the end. So if anybody thinks they're leaving, you won't get it until the end. So um, they are going to preserve the original um, facade and the structure of the building. They're going to deconstruct it and reconstruct it. That's, how they, that's the model that they work with. They do it extremely well. Uh, and. It will be um, converted into an 86 room, uh, five level Wyndham Trip Hotel. So Google uh, Wyndham Hotels and then the Trip brand, and you'll see the quality of what we're going to get. It'll have provisions for retail, um, a health spa, a gym and conference facilities, and its site and its location will be secured for the central city. Look, it was extremely welcome news for us. It's something, as a council, you know, we wanted this to happen. But it wasn't actually, council was the enabler. Um, it wasn't actually our role to buy it and do that. And, well, I don't think it was. And we needed um, the commercial sector to step forward. But I'm certainly excited about the outcome. Um, and I just want to talk about the building, building's beginnings and history. So, you know, that's construction in 1905. And if you go back to our pioneering uh, postal services, they were actually responsible in some ways for uh, christening our name. Uh, we were Palmerston, and then we became Palmerston North because of the New Zealand Post Office. Because they got the mail mixed up, basically. Um, some say they still do today, but uh, um, it's, uh, it's because of that. Uh, and, and they obviously had this um, belief in it that they needed to build something quite grand here. And in some ways, the period of growth the city is experiencing at the moment uh, could almost equate to what happened back there in the early 1900s. Some stats on population. The parcel population grew from uh, 6,500 in 1901 to reach 10,000 in just five years. 
by the Credit Report 1906. And that's the same year that this brand new old building was opened. So that's a surge of uh, about 3,700 people. That's a population increase of 57%. These are some of the messenger boys that were out doing it because it was a post office and telegraph building. And this, uh, these boys would be out there uh, running the errands. And, uh, you know, that, that 1900 staircase um, almost could be equated for now, but not in every, in every sense. So the population increase, to give you a perspective, Say a population again, with a census coming, who knows what that will bring. Um, but you know, let's say we're 92,000 at the moment, because we don't, there's no specs aren't really no go for the uh, And if you if you put the same percentage rate over the same number uh, of years, that'd be an equivalent of another 51,000 people coming to pass the north. That'd make well one heck of a, a, an annual plan and how we coach with that. You know, there'll be 10,000 people per year. And it would put us at uh, 141,000 in five years time. So that just shows you how quickly milestones were at that time. It's a, um, telegraph um, gallery. And, uh, you know, there's uh, obviously the building and lots of past and families went through and generations of people worked for the post office in those days. And look, um, hats off to our former Palmerston Borough councillors and, and council workers that coped with that influx in those 1900s. And that level of uh, growth marks playing by the town really acquired some quite prestigious heritage buildings. If you think not only the, the post office, but think the Grand Hotel, and then various banks, uh, insurance companies, um, Catholic Cathedral, Saints Church, and, and the TNG Tower later years. So if I go back to 1871 and the beginning of Palmerston to North and its connection with postal services, George Nelson, he was the settlement's uh, first um, uh, general store owner and he also became the postmaster and registrar. It also uh, possibly coincided with the appointment uh, and announcement on uh, the 17th of July 1871 in the New Zealand Gazette, uh, which read, Notice is hereby given that the name of the post office in the province of Wellington, known as Palmerston, has been changed to Palmerston North. So that's when that all happened. And the establishment um, of this settlement now with a population just a bit over 200 really started to grow. But we also were quite a centre, or become quite a centre in those days for transportation and communication needs. And they were essential for, for the operation of postal services. That same year, for instance, uh, the bridle track um, uh, from the town was uh, went through right through the, the uh, uh, number two gorge. It was completed in maybe the modern version that we're trying to get through today. Um, still quite isn't uh, sorted, but uh, it will happen through the issues at some stage. We were a real centre for rail. In the following year, in 1872, the first New Zealand manufactured uh, locomotive uh, chugged away into the square on a completed leg of uh, the then completed uh, tramway to Foxton. A replica of that early engine, which was uh, uh, manufactured in Dunedin, sits outside the Foxton Courthouse Museum. Armstrong's first public school was also established in 1872. And that was on the corner of Main and Princess Street with the Empire Hotel now is. Uh, in 1875, a, a telegraph connection was established to Foxton. Foxton was actually bigger and actually the port and, uh, and uh, probably, probably the centre in those days of uh, business because uh, a lot of shipping came through there. And the town's uh, first newspaper, in Two Times, was published. 1876, the, the wooden tramway now connected uh, the town with the port was upgraded to steel rails and the town's first uh, station was actually built right in the middle of the square to my uh, And our first uh, wooden bridge across the, uh, the river to the Turk Bridge was completed in 1877. And Palmerston, to give you an understanding, and now grown to 800 people. It was incorporated as a bugger in 1877. Um, and uh, that man was elected 
appears to be an endorsed Nelson. Arms called Tawanganui Rail Line opened in 1878 and jumping ahead to 1886. The privately owned uh, Wellington Mail to Railway Company uh, completed the Wellington to Mail to Line with the railhead based at Longville. Uh, just, a, just a matter of interest, in 1892, uh, the company's American built um, uh, broad wooden class locomotive established a world speed record right here uh, in this part of New Zealand on the narrow gauge from Wellington to Longburn. Impressive fact that not many people would know. And it was a special train, it was a one hour, 58 minute run, non stop uh, for the 135k distance, and it hit a top speed of 103 kilometres. So quite impressive in um, 1892. Um, the tracks in those days um, followed the Johnsonville line out of Wellington, um, plenty of steep hills and twisting and, and hilly grades, so it makes it even more impressive um, that the locomotive was able to attain that speed. I mean, today, a lot of the tracks have been uh, tunneled, straightened, and moving. So, sort of backtracking to 1888, um, uh, a new gadget called the telephone. Um, started to attract duty of Dr. Seward and Palmerston to North and it was quite a subscription service to that. In 1893, the Palmerston North Hospital was opened, and uh, on the death of uh, Queen Victoria in 1901, it uh, really did bring the uh, end of an era of the Victorian era, and Palmerston North was uh, then well connected to uh, all parts of the Lower North Island by rail, uh, telegraph, and through its connecting roads, but the roads left a huge amount of desire. Uh, in fact, uh, the, it was the lower North Island because it actually wasn't on rail service to Auckland until 1909. And if you wanted to get to Auckland by road, you actually had to go via Napier because the road finished at Tyre. Quite incredible. Um, and uh, as the Edwardian area picked up, uh, there was, uh, there was a lot of uh, grand building starting and projects starting to happen. And the 1906 post office building was the main attraction. That's an image from 1937. Um, but just to give some context of other buildings, as I said, banks were among contributors to the construction boom. Um, some that can remember the Shepherd's Rest and uh, Andrew Young Street that was demolished in uh, 2012, and it's an unfortunate thing that we had demolished a lot of our green buildings. That two-storey building was constructed in 1900 and, and housed um, Mrs. Peter's coffee place, but it also was used as a um, boarding establishment in some neighbourhood. The district high school with uh, gender-separated classrooms was opened with boys' highs now in 1902. 1902, the, the Coronation Fountain uh, in the square uh, was actually been shifted around a few times, but it would actually be started life um, almost in the centre of the square. Uh, it, went, it then went to the southwestern part here in the green space uh, to make way for the uh, War Memorial Cenotaph, and then it was relocated to its present site. In 1902, the BNZ building had a, uh, was a new building was erected on the corner of the church in Fitzherbert, uh, now, uh, now Fitzherbert Avenue. And Palmerston North was starting to be a town on the move. The famous uh, Palmerston North department store, Collinson and Cunningham, opened its doors in uh, 1904. Uh, and on Broad Street, which is known as Broad Street, then now Broadway Avenue in 1926. And the new, new railway hotel building on Main Street opened as a hotel in 1904 05. And that replaced an original building in 1892. Um, but they got the plumb site right opposite the uh, the then railway station. 1905, and many will remember this, I certainly do, uh, the uh, town's grand opera house, and it opened on Church Street, your farmers is today. And this grand building, the Grand Hotel. So that uh, also opened in 1906, and it was a, it was a French styled uh, architecture, and that's on the corner of the square and church. And when it opened, it was the largest hotel outside the four main centres. So again, we get, we're getting a picture that Armstrong North was uh, batting way above its weight. 
this is, a, this is a, a, an early image of uh, the PTT hours uh, statue um, over on the far side of the Tamaraina in the square. And this marble statue was sponsored by his sister, the Iranian Tamaraina, and it's been a, uh, a recent uh, portrait of her. And uh, that was unveiled in, in 1907. And on Te Awe, it's on Te Awe, on Te Awe Street, Kashi Birch Homestead, that served as the vice regal residence for the Governor General, Lord Plunkett, in 1908. And for a brief time, Palmerston North was the centre for Government House. In 1909, the Redwood uh, Technical School of Princess Street was opened, uh, the Butterfly Pond and Bridge. Uh, in the square to Manawahine, courtesy of the Palmerston North Beautification Society, was completed. Probably we should get one of those for you. And the silent movie um, cinema, Her Majesty's Theatre on George Street, opened in 1911. And that theatre was started as a skating rink um, and it ended its days as a ballroom, a story, and many of you will remember that. It actually was the largest dance hall in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, unfortunately, that ballroom was demolished in um, 1984, but the entrance lobby remains, and that's number 54 George Street. So history is really full of um, interesting facts, angles, and and uh, and sometimes rabbit holes. But um, I do hope that gives you a, a quick idea of what was being developed in Palmerston North around that time. That the uh, 1906 uh, state of the art post office was being uh, being developed. And it's a building that really uh, uh, has shown a huge, uh, huge amount of, um, or a huge role in the story of Palmerston North. Um, it was actually the town's fourth post office, um, and it began uh, with plans by prominent Bones and based architect Joshua Charlesworth. You know, he was um, quite significant in the Lower North Island. He designed the Wellington Town Hall in 1901. Uh, and actually, this is not, this is the this is the Eastman Cafe, but it was the media post office. He also uh, and it looked it was uh, it was uh, his new two-story um, Italian-style building with the clock tower um, that replaced um, this wooden post office here, which um, which served us since 1899. And uh, it got moved on. It actually moved to the side of the, of the canal. Um, building over there for a while, and then it became uh, moved to the East Mountains, converted to the Cafe of the Mountains today. Construction of the building was um, handled by local firm J. Trevor and Son. They had a brick making business on Boundary Road, which is now Tremaine Avenue. And it seems there was quite a lot of wheeling and dealing going on behind the scenes in those days. It doesn't happen now, I can't see. <laughs> This chap, William Wood, it's not Councillor William Wood. <laughs> but uh, uh, William Wood is an Australian born blacksmith and he was actually a, a, one of our former members, a former of members. He was, in those days, um, seemed to be a progression, maybe it does happen today, but it won't be happening for me, as he became the town's MP. And uh, he then became the town's MP. He negotiated um, with the government of the day, the Liberal Party. Uh, led by Kenda Richards uh, Seddon to stump up with half the cost of the building. And I wish they hadn't done that. Who's telling me? We need we need a bit of influence. But uh, his wife was very influential too. And uh, Mel would lead a local fundraising campaign uh, to raise the rest of the money and for the clock to our chimes. You know, there's a bit of story around raising the country raising money. So this is Sir Joseph Moore, and the completed post office was opened in February 1906 by the Treasurer, like today's equivalent Minister of Finance. But this man loved opening post offices, and he was the Postmaster General, went to the opening of an envelope, but uh, he seriously did yeah. like post offices. Um, the, the, the current mayor was uh, Morris Cohen, and he, uh, ceremony uh, posted the first letter. The grand opening was pretty, pretty big stuff for a town which was soon to become a city um, of our size. Ward was a, an extremely high-profile politician, and 
would be knighted in 1901. And as well as introducing the penny post to New Zealand, Ward also set up the world's first Ministry of Health. He was also um, instrumental in establishing the first Ministry of Tourism. And if you think back to those days, tourism, you know, we'd be happy to get people here. It's hard enough um, travelling around New Zealand, we won't get anybody here. So he was quite uh, far, far thinking. And at the opening, Sir Joseph described it as the most modern post office in the country. And it also signalled quite a prosperous future for Palmerston North. In that same year, uh, Ken Dick said he died unexpectedly uh, that year, and uh, Ward succeeded him as the New Zealand Premier. Kenny Tapano. So this man was the original owner of, of the site. Uh, it was Lani Tane Kamata, and he was the original owner of the site that uh, stands on today. Locally, the fundraising wouldn't have been successful uh, if uh, Mrs. Wood, um, the mayoress, uh, started the clock and the chimes, and they brought in Lani Tane, and they were named after uh, this, this prominent chief, um, who at the time was aged 101 years. And in those days, he was also known as Mr. Gray. He died at 103, two years later in 1908, and his tiny uh, or fan or attracted many, well, they say over a thousand people. But there was a walking funeral procession, uh, that's all, a walking funeral um, that estimated was over a quarter mile long. So the man was revered. In 1909, the post office building, uh, which was right alongside the recently nationalised and completed uh, North Island Railway line, it housed the post office savings bank and upstairs the telephone exchange, and it serviced um, nearly 600 subscribers in those days. And grand, grand old building. And it really was a symbol of pride in the town's progress and becoming a modern place, a focal point for business. Um, and it featured on many bus cards. Now, increasing mail volume started to happen, banking was becoming uh, a real thing. Uh, uh, other communication services during World War I uh, resulted in further extensions to the building. In 1917, and while the importance um, of the post office for news, especially of loved ones that have been fighting on the, on the front, uh, on the front could not be underestimated. So it really did. It was a it was a centre for everybody. Ten years later, in uh, 1927, was designated a chief post office, and that was three years before the city became so before Palmerston became a city. It was given official status, a population that just took to like 20,000. And to put it into context, we were New Zealand's seventh city after Christchurch, uh, Auckland, uh, Wellington, Dunedin, Nelson, and Fonda. Not an interesting fact. The city in 1930 um, also became an ear hub with Union Airways based out of Nelson, and they established their headquarters here. So we enter into the uh, ear mail business and we became part of those services, but perhaps not quite the way we would expect. So there was no night flying in those days. So to get mail for the South Island, posted out of Auckland or Whangarei, and need to be sorted and bagged at the end of the day. Then it was sent on the overnight train express to Palmerston North, where the mail was unloaded from the train, shifted out to the airport, and put on board the early morning Union Airways flights to Leedon, Christchurch, and Dunedin. Aucklanders heading to the South Island uh, adopted the same train and plane strategy, and they found their destinations eventually. <laughs> Sometimes it took a couple of days. But, uh, you know, increasing mail volumes, phone services resulted in further uh, building expansion. So you can notice that the, the building was increased at the site. Uh, and these are some images from uh, 1950, 1963, 1988. With the arrival of the 28th Night of Battalion beginning in 1940 to three months training showgrounds, post office um, would have experienced a further 
a huge volume of mail that needed to be sent, sorted, and received. And as World War I, uh, the post office and its services became a real central focal point for families and soldiers uh, in uh, fighting overseas. In June and August uh, 1942, uh, there were two 7.92 earthquakes centred in the Wairarapa, right and uh, they caused the collapse of many chimneys in the, in the city. Uh, and there were several new misses uh, for masonry around the city centre. So the distinctive post office plot tower, um, along with the building's external embellishments and parapets, were removed disproportionately, sadly, because I had to go back to the. That had to that, it had some, it had some real look about it. So it became a result in a much plainer looking, but in the eyes of health and safety, much safer structure. So the Kiri Tapanu chimes in the, in the post office um, clock were taken down. They were kept in storage. The city looked after those for a period of time before they were installed in the Hotwood Clock Tower um, in the in 1957. And they still bring out to them. Businessman Arthur Hotwood, he donated £10,000 uh, towards construction of the tower. And to put that in today's money, that was 300000 I wish we had a few more people like that to do. With the rapid growth of um, telephone landlines, uh, more changes were afoot. In 1961, the telephone exchange was rehoused in a new building on Church Street. And uh, on the other side of that building is Church Street, also, and that's the telephone exchange. And this was in the late 60s, the second story um, uh, telecom tower. And it was designed as a hub for the whole region's telephone, uh, telecommunications. Um, and it's often referred to as the telecom tower. But the building was also dubbed K9 because it looked like the side of the dog of Doctor Who series, um, K9. It's been called many other things too. The complex now occupied by Spark New Zealand Group um, and uh, uh, in 2015, uh, this building and unfortunately the battleship in our, our, our city building were both examples of 1960s architectural style accorded concrete brutalism, and they were named in the top 10 list of New Zealand's ugliest buildings. I don't think you could deny that. <laughs> Look, paint's been applied to, to soften it up to, I, haven't I purposely haven't shown you another photo because. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's to soften its uncompromising um, exterior lines. Uh, and on on April uh, first, uh, nineteen eighty seven, New Zealand Post Office wrongly or rightly uh, corporised uh, its business, um, split into three separate companies: Telecom, Postbank, New Zealand Post. Each company was set up as an SOE, a state-owned enterprise, and they were expected to operate as a commercial entity. Around the country, uh, this resulted in the closure of 432 post offices. That's why I see what I'm going to write on. As a post office, um, the building on the square continued to, continued to serve until uh, 1988 uh, when the post office, the New Zealand Post, moved to new premises on the corner of Main and Princess. Remember that? That used to drive through. And the post office savings bank uh, continued to occupy the old building. Uh, but after that, it was sold to the ANZ uh, in 1989, and they eventually uh, migrated their services to the hill. So it started a new piece of life. And for the next two decades, uh, the building kept up its heels as a restaurant, bar, and night spot. Firstly, as Eagle Rock, and then as High Flyers. And then many residents still refer to it as the High Flyers building. And uh, some of the branding sort of still existed there until property brokers um, like so put their sold signs up over it. In 2009, uh, an attached concrete terrace for the Alfresco dining was controversially um, put on the side. Um, and following the devastating Canterbury earthquakes in 2010 and 2011, with the National Building Standards uh, being enacted, 
a high flyers that was supposed to vacate the premises. Uh, the building's new owners, uh, E2 New Homes and Properties, were planning a major retail development for the site, which would have included um, hotel and car parking and a popular bus terminal. In 2013, uh, the property company closed uh, the building for renovations, but they moved to the same year. I was elected to council, uh, and I might be concerned actually was the central city of the state of it. Uh, E2 homes and properties collapsed the following year in 2014, more than $2 million in debt, and the future of the former chief post office was up in the year. 2015, um, I was elected mayor in by election and uh, restoring some of the retail vitality and central business um, activity was probably one of my main aims. But it's been an important challenge, but actually, the way people shop, the way people live now and do business and this is quite different. Uh, so promoting a new use for the building was, a, was important but also keeping the city heritage. But in 2015 um, this building was subject to a mortgage assignment. It was picked up by an open company called Palmston Post. It turned out that the new owners weren't really willing to take up the redevelopment opportunities suggested by the, the former owners and endorsed by council of the day. Uh, this included uh, a resource consent to turn, as I said, the site into a hotel, a retail space, and other utility. In July 2016, the high flyers portion of the building was slapped with a dangerous building notice. And the building's last tenant was a sports bar called the Dale, quite part there. That moved out in 2017, and it's now another part of the city. So it was that vacant ever since, and this once proud symbol, which uh, Sir Joseph and others have been part of, opening was left as a real empty shell. It, uh, it, you know, it was it an attractive antisocial uh, behaviour. It was broken into and it really did fall into decay. Naturally enough, uh, this really increased the concerns of many residents. I've got so many letters and emails about it. the business community um, were up in arms and actually council was not happy more. It got to a stage where financially it, made, it probably made greater sense for any developer to knock it down the start of However, that wasn't a viable option. Fortunately, the building did have protection status. But uh, that does, it does actually hinder some, some developments. But fortunately, the right owners were found and uh, it was great that in um, October um, 2022, um, finally a new building owner was found. And want to acknowledge the property broker, property brokers team, especially those in human carrying who broke the deal. The council team had quite a lot of important role to um, get this over the line. So here's what we're waiting for. So here are some new plans, and, and I'll, uh, I've got a couple more here, and, and a final artist's impression of the new hotel. It's uh, going to be five levels. It'll be a 4.5 um, star hotel. Um, that can give you an idea of where it will sit. With the, this, uh, 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 the old post office facade, the new constructing construction of the tower block at the back, the TMG tower set there the center base at the moment. It's looking from the bus side. That will be the link from the from the old building to the new building. Finally that's what's going to look like. They'll get constructed the way they do these things. They hold the facade up and then pull everything out from the back, strengthen, put everything back in, and, and basically reconstruct it, keeping the old um, windows, the old beams. Brick would be possible sometimes they have a number of bricks. A little bit like the cathedral down in Christchurch, but strength. 
Yeah. But the outside walls, you know, it's yeah, it's, it's These guys have their own, their own, their own offices in, in Auckland. It's not dissimilar to this. I mean, they've, um, they've kept the facade, they've built an 18 story hotel at the back. It's opposite TV New Zealand um, and Victoria Street in Auckland. And they deconstructed the building and put it back together. Exposed beams, um, skylights, the old windows. Your and, uh, they, but they know how to do it. That's the key. They know how to do it. And they, they build as an engineer. Do you mean Absolutely. Well, no, the key about this, I mean, they have track. They've done 18 of them. So, keeping understanding that the New Zealand DOE. Co op building in Hamilton, that's a pretty building in Victoria Street in Hamilton. And then there's been a question to the back of that. I'm still in that building. Their own building was the Hills Money Factory in Victoria Street in the Victorian Grand in Auckland. It's a um, in the sky of the tower there. And they had a wonderful day with that next to their, their offices. And they've also done the uh, May and Bryant matches factory in Wellington and Tory Street, and that is becoming the new um, Women and Trip Hotel as well. As well as the number down in this town as well. So they're well, they're well versed, and um, they, they're one of three companies that deals with things in a super fund. Um, well, they could probably do this. Oh, yeah, but it's not. So the building. If you saw the original building, um, it stops there. It doesn't go. You know, that was all added on as, as you know, as iterations of the building. Um, and you can see where, you can see where it's it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, that 1920s and 30s. So. Probably the parking no, no, it, the building goes way back. The site is very large. So, there's, yes, there's another, there's another site. Swami, um, from the previous purchase of the new building, um, I see the, um, out the intrusion into the street that's speaking of the existence. Oh, look, that's yet to be decided. I mean, these are, these are uh, some questions. And they, they need to go through all those risk consent to be able to, and that, well, that's all needs to be sorted. Doesn't get the sun until two o'clock. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, just regarding to the question now, the, the raised terrace in the street, uh, we're working with the developer uh, around that. It's currently being also designing the streetscape just outside that. So, the current thinking is, uh, and, and nothing's been confirmed, but the current discussions likely that terrace is going to be removed. Uh, they, and that, that opens up the streetscape that's going to come through there to be a much more functional street supporting the building. Um, so we're, we're just in that sort of negotiation space about, I guess, what role does the public space play to the public, uh, to the private investment, and, and vice versa. I suppose on the other foot, you know, if you're a building owner, one for the fifty million, then you'd probably fight to keep it if it was done well. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I guess it's been yeah, done well in the yeah. past. And, and part of that is, is, I guess, it triggers some of the heritage. Aspects of the building conversation. So it's just a fine balance of trying to make the game. And to actually activate the street, if you want to have this on this way, look at Christchurch, look what they're doing, this is what they're doing. So, I mean, it, 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 Dave's right, there is a balance, but I think all, everything needs to be taken into perspective because uh, um, nobody else is investing in the building. What I'm concerned about is the problem here. Uh, 
you know, look, yeah, and that's with everybody driving cars and everybody. I mean, we would hope this can attract, um, uh, you know, people that, that, that come in coaches like bus tours and those sorts of things. Um, the whole way traffic spun in the city centre actually will be lost. We probably, you know, from people of our vintage, you know, we remember everybody in cars and also everybody getting in the park right outside the door they want to. It's changing a little bit, and I, I agree that there's some tension about what's happening there at the moment. Um, I would hope that that would get slightly better with the city being slower, like a maximum speed in the, in the city would be here of 30 kilometres now. You can't really go much faster than that anyway. And, and the inner ring road forms, this is more pedestrianised, slower speed than that, um, and people coming in here. And if they may end up being, um, you know, some sort of shuttle that drops people off too. So, yeah, there's still a bit of work to be done on the traffic management side. It's going to occupy the whole area of the post field Yes. Why not that part of the Yes, yeah, they bought the whole site. There's still a little bit of work to be done. They've, um, that won't occupy the whole site. There's still be still a little bit of uh, vacant space there, and they'll be working with council officers on what that might look like. But then they we still get to form, um, finalise and formalise what we're doing with the bus terminal. And if you look at any modern city, um, they have some sort of terminus. If you want to look back to the old days of Newmans, we used to drive into. Um, the bus will drive into Newman's from Ainsley Street, um, park up undercover. It was a cafe, a waiting room. We've gone backwards. To, I think it was sitting in a shelter um, in, in the wet. Um, so I, I personally think you need to lift the standard of what you're offering. And as a council, I hope we're going to move in that direction. Yeah, so they're, they're ahead of schedule. I think they're coming down to see um, council offices um, this month, and uh, I know they're down in April as well. I spoke to them this morning because I just didn't get permission to use with this, and uh, and they were quite excited that we were seeing them. So yeah, this is the first off the of the day, but I don't think anybody else has seen this. Um, so, uh, look, these sort of things, it's all around um, construction, timelines, and everything else, but 2025 and open. So it will take them about 18 months to build it. And if you look at other buildings of a similar size, like the new FMG building, uh, that was about the same time frame. Yeah. So Randy Tane on that. And, uh, Again, a little bit like this. I've had a couple of close deals all over, uh, but its site is still significant. Uh, well, the location is a significant site. Um, it's something will happen there. Um, in terms of how the buildings look at, I mean, but again, I'm not sure where they're at, but they have asked that, again, that building's been added on and added on and added on. We'll demolish the old parts of the building that don't have a uh, heritage list coming. Um, I'm sure we are able to, um, that will take some cost to use this to, to really build lots and lots of concrete. Yeah, yeah, and it can, there's probably some discussions to be had around the refinement. It's, it's, you can beautify the front, but it's actually around the back as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the great thing about investment is it does invest, investment tracks are investment. So the ownership of that part of the square is in two hands, and I know that they will be looking very closely at this. They wanted something to get over the line for them to be invest. So I'm thinking going to be pretty confident things will happen. The TNG bill is an interesting one. It got sold in a quasi energy sale, but 
solved for the price of cash. Um, it's got an item that probably doesn't understand what they're doing. So I'm going to go Look, I talked to them every now and then. It's pretty hard. We offered some uh, funds out of the Heritage Fund to clean the building and then took the money and uh, would have cleaned it himself with a good long brush. So that's why everything's done to them. It's got to be scaffolded and uh, done properly. That's a, that's a discussion for another day, but um, I, I share your complete frustration. It's, it's embarrassing and it's quite an eye. It's, 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 a, it's a, a landmark for us and it doesn't look good when we've come up to the city. I don't have any history with that building, but I'm sad if I can count build parts of that yard that are off the post office and before the one on the screen. How long is that property? Um, that's 1920s, uh, 10 days. Look, everyone might to tell the time in those days. I know. We've offered to fix the clock. The clock's quite old. Um, it, will, it will require some um, some work. Again, if you have the right owner, you get a fixed one. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Grant. Um, that was really fantastic. Lovely to hear the history and also something for us to look forward to over the next few months or more. Um, just a, a couple of messages that I just want to pass on. Um, we do have an architecture tour starting um, at 3.30. It'll be a buildings tour uh, starting in the uh, Timurai Ohine, looking at the, the buildings around the square. Please do join us um, next 3.30. There's still a few spaces there, so if you'd like to come, we'd love to see you. Um, also tomorrow, it's 12.30 here, uh, the Manawatu Leaders Accord, they're going to give us an update on what's happening with our beautiful Manawatu River. So that will again be a, a really good session. So it'd be lovely if you can come to that. Um, one little sad announcement. Unfortunately, Fire Storm Summers, which was going to happen on Saturday afternoon, we've had to cancel that. So that will not be happening at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Um, and it continues. <laughs> it's all been quite amazing. Um, Heritage Month, we have a brochure available here. There is lots happening throughout the month and there's a lot happening next week. So please grab this, have a look, share it, um, pencil in what you want to come to and we really want to see you. So. Thank you, and thank you, Brad. Fantastic.